Are you wondering how to apply the rational zero theorem to find all the real zeros of some polynomial function? Well, you've come to the right place, my friend, because that's what I'm going to teach you. So first of all, what is the rational uh, zero theorem? Well, it simply says that if you take some factor of your constant term, and then you divide it by some factor of the coefficient of your leading term, meaning the highest power of x, in this problem it's a 1, then that division will result in one of the possible answers for one of the possible zeros. In other words, let me show you. So first thing, list out the factors of 24. So write down 24, and then you want to think about the numbers, the whole numbers that are multiply to give you 24. So you got a 1 and a 24, right? This goes back way back to some right math that you probably did in like middle school. Uh, then you'd have like 2 and you would have 12. Then you would have 3, and then you would have 8, and then you would have 4 and 6, right? So that should be all of the values, all of the whole numbers. Now this is known as, these factors are known as the p-value. If you're like, what the heck is p? Don't worry about it. You really don't even need to know it. They just call it p. I'll explain it in a second. Um, then what you're going to do is you're going to take then the coefficient of the leading x term, which is a 1, and you're going to list out the factors of 1. And then you're like, well, it's just 1 and 1, right? 1 times 1. Good. Now, though, what might be a little different from what you did kind of in middle school is that each of these come with a plus and minus value, right? Each of these come with a plus and minus value because technically, if you were to, let's say, plus minus, actually, before I mess this up, let me just finish. So let's say, uh, you know, when you're looking at 1, yes, positive 1 times positive 1 gives you 1 but also negative 1 times negative 1 also gives you 1. So therefore, positive and negative 1 is a factor of 1. All right, so that's why I'm writing it in the following way. Now, you don't even have to write, since I just duplicated this twice, you don't have to write one of them, right, because it's just the same thing. All right. Now, the factors then of the leading coefficient are going to be known as the q-value. So if you take now the p-value, one of the factors of p, and you divide it then by q, what the rational zero theorem says is that some combination of this division will give you some of the real zeros. All right, it's a little, I don't know who would really use this kind of in practice, but um, basically what I'm saying is that you're going to take these, okay, these are all the p-values, and then you're going to divide that by all of your q-values, which in this problem is just plus and minus 1. And basically now what I'm saying is that some combination of 1, positive 1, negative 1, divided by positive 1, negative 1 could be a rational 0. Then maybe plus minus 2 divided by plus minus 1 could be another possible answer. Then plus minus 3 over this, right? If you, if you notice, you're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 possible things to test out, right? Both positive and negative, by the way. So that's even more than that. It's like 16. Now, this gets a little nuts, okay? What, are you going to test out 16 things, right? Um, I mean, if you had to apply this, like, totally, then yes. you gotta, you got to just start testing, all right? So um, let's do an example, right? So I'm going to pick one that I actually know will, will work, all right? Um, so I'm going to pick, uh, I'm going to pick then the P over Q value equal to negative 3, all right? So basically, whether you're dividing then negative 3 by a positive 1, or whether you are dividing a positive 3 by a negative 1, it really doesn't matter, okay? Because they're both going to wind up in a division value of negative 3. So what now we're going to do is we're going to now test and determine whether this, and we can do this in a couple of ways, but we want to test now whether this term gives us a zero remainder when it is then... Uh, divided on in to this polynomial. In other words, we can use what's known as the remainder theorem. Okay, we can use the remainder theorem. So what I want to do is test this possible zero value, right? Now remember, what does it mean for a real zero? Remember, real zeros are just the locations where the function will cross the x-axis, or in other words, that gives the function value equal to zero. All right, so all I now need to do to use the remainder theorem 
is everywhere now I see an x value, I'm going to plug in my negative 3. And if this now works, so negative 3 cubed minus then 3 times negative 3 squared minus 10 times negative 3 plus 24, if this does indeed equal 0, then I know for a fact that this is a real 0. Okay? That's the whole idea behind the remainder theorem. If you need more help with the remainder, th remainder theorem, if I can speak, that would help. Um, check out the playlist here um, on our channel. I have maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 videos just on that. So what I'm going to do now is you can do the math in your head or whatever, but I'm just going to show you how to plug it in on the calculator. When you do this, please use the parentheses exactly as written so that it gets plugged into the calculator properly. So then with minus then 3 times then negative 3, all right, squared, and then we're going to do minus 10, parentheses, then negative 3. So plus then 24. If you notice, I put parentheses around every value I substitute. Oh, and look, it came out to be 0, right? So I know that this is now going to be a rational, uh, a uh, real 0. I know that the function now, this thing, will cross the x-axis at an x value equal to negative 3. Now, the whole thing about this, right, is that now, you know, you, remember, I, 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 I knew that this was a, ahead of time, a, a real zero, okay? But if you didn't, right, not using a calculator, not really do, you would have to test all of these possible combinations. I mean, you know, that's going to take you 45 minutes. You'll do one question on the text, uh, test and you'll wind up, you know, with a 14 or something. So it's really not reasonable to kind of test all of these values, although that's kind of the theory, all right? Um, but... The idea now from here is once you find a real zero, what you can now do is you can now do synthetic division, okay, to find then the uh, remaining function, all right? So let's clean this up a little bit. Bam. So what I'm going to do is use synthetic division here. And remember, in the table, the number of columns here, okay, will equal your highest power of x in your polynomial function plus 1, so 4, all right? So therefore, in this column goes the x cubed coefficient, this is the x squared coefficient, that's the x coefficient and the constant term. So we're just going to literally plug it in as we see it. So the coefficient of the x term is going to be a 1, x squared is a minus 3, x is going to be a negative 10, and this is going to be 24. Then what you do is whenever you find that factor, right, whenever you do your uh, 17 tests to hopefully come up with 1, uh, you're going to take that um, 0 then, and uh, did I say factor? I meant to say 0, okay? Um, you're going to take that zero value and plug it in here on the outside of the table, and then you're just going to now follow the division algorithm of synthetic division. Drop down the first value all the way down. That's why there's a red uh, box here. Don't put anything there. Then take the bottom number, multiply it by the outside number. That's going to give you the next value to put into your adjacent cell. Then you add this column together for a total of negative 6. Then you take this number and still multiply it by the outside, so that's a positive 18. You add this together, that's an 8. Then take the bottom number, multiply by that. That's going to be a negative 24. Add this together, and boom. Notice how the remainder is 0. But that's what we said it should be. Because this is a 0 of the function, and it should give a remainder when synthetically divided. All right? Now, keep in mind, then, what this kind of represents. What this represents are these are now the coefficients of the polynomial that is left over, okay, after you do the synthetic division. So basically what I did, just to keep in mind, I took this function and I divided it then by, I didn't really, I did not divide it by minus three, okay? I divided it by the factor of minus three. So I divided it by x plus three, technically. And when you do this division then, okay, what you get out is you got this function that I'm going to write down now, okay? Remember, this is the constant term. This is the x coefficient of the x term, and that's the coefficient of the x squared term. It is not. I know I wrote x cubed up here, but that's only for the top column, okay? If you need more help with synthetic division, I have like, I don't know, 30 videos dedicated just to synthetic division. So the polynomial here is going to be x squared minus then 6x plus 8, okay? This is what's left over. Now what we can do is we can apply now nice techniques, right, to possibly factor this on out and find the zeros, okay? 
So what we can do is we can always use the quadratic formula on this, the negative b plus or minus square root of 4ac all over 2a, that thing, all right? Or since I have a leading coefficient of a 1, I can think about two numbers that multiply to 8, but that then yet add to negative 6, right? That helps me find the factors. Let me just move that. So the factors here are going to be x minus 4 and x minus 2. Because a negative 4 and a negative 2 multiplied together give you a positive 8, and a negative 4 you know, plus a negative 2 give you a negative 6. So then what you can do is from these factors, you can always find the zeros, right? You can always find those zeros now. You set each of these equal to 0, right? And then, you know, you just find the, the x value, right? That would be x is equal to 4 on one of them, and then you would do the same thing for this, and you realize that x is also equal to 2. So... What you have now found is you found the three, and I didn't really make those boxes nice and neat, which is kind of bothering me a little bit. There we go. What you now have found is you found now all of the possible zeros, okay? So, and we would anticipate that there could be a maximum of three zeros here, real zeros, because the power kind of tells us the maximum number, all right, the leading power. You can also check this by using the calculator. Watch, let's graph the function. See, I already graphed it, all right? So I kind of did that ahead of time so I didn't have to, you know, go through 17 guesses to try to figure it out, which is unreasonable. Um, so what you're going to do is graph the thing, and here's the graph of the function, okay? Notice where it crosses the x-axis. It crosses at negative 1, negative 2, there, negative 3. Oh, look, negative 3. Then it also crossed it at positive 2 and positive 4. Positive 2, positive 4. All right. It's so much easier to use the calculator on this if you're allowed. But if you have to strictly apply the rational zero theorem, like I said, you're going to have to test however many possibilities come out, um, which is kind of nuts. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you don't have to do that. Thanks for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. If you liked what you saw here, if you don't mind liking and subscribing, I would really appreciate that. That'd be so awesome. And maybe even tell some of your classmates. We have thousands of videos out there, not only in math, but we got physics chemistry as well. We have thousands of problems solved. All right, because guess what you're going to see on your exams? Yep, problems. Take care.